All right, let's finish up what is turning out to be the longest uh, lecture in the history of time. Sorry about that. Just cracked open my bang. Okay, so the end ending of this lecture from here on, this is talking about epidemiology, okay? So let's uh, talk about a couple of definitions. So a communicable disease is when uh, an infected host can transmit the pathogen to another host and the pathogen can then establish infection in that host. Once again, given that there's a high enough infectious dose and that that person is immunocompromised enough. Okay, so a communicable disease can be passed from one person to another. Then if we take that a little further, the term contagious means highly communicable. Okay, so let me give you an example of the difference. Okay, so HIV, um, we know is communicable. It can be passed from person to person. However, it requires either really intimate sexual contact or um, blood to blood contact. So it's not contagious, okay, but it is communicable. Contagious, would be COVID-19 because it's spread through the respiratory route and it's easily passed from person to person. Okay, so rhinovirus would fit into that. Um, potentially influenza would fit into that when we see you know, flu epidemics every year. So contagious just means that it's highly communicable. Then we have non-communicable disease. So this is not gonna happen from passing things from person to person. Um, it includes endogenous infections. So remember pathogens that are already present on the person, or perhaps the person has accidental contact with a microbe that's in maybe a water supply or um, you know, passed in terms of foodborne, maybe you know, um, a restaurant worker doesn't wash their hands and then they, get, um, they contaminate a food supply. And then that um, you know, can lead to um, a microbial disease, but it's not communicable, okay? They're getting it from something that's not living. For it to be communicable, it has to be passed from person to person. So, um, you know, here's some examples. Once again, this great artwork, okay? So um, different types um, of patterns of transmission. And also there's a worksheet that has to do with this. So yeah, direct contact. Yep, if you're making out with someone, that's gonna be direct contact. Um, droplets is gonna be people who are close to each other that are talking, coughing, okay? Like, you know, that's why we're all supposed to wear face masks for COVID-19. Vertical transmission is very specific. It is just from mom to baby when the baby is in utero. Vectors, we've talked about, those are mosquitoes. Um, if it's a biological vector, also could be things like house flies. Um, if it is a mechanical vector. Okay, we're gonna get to what fomites are. And um, one thing that you'll see mentioned on the worksheet is fecal oral route or fecal oral contamination. Okay, so when you hear that, you know, it sounds terrible, um, but I'm not talking about, you know, the human centipede here. Um, remember, these are microorganisms, so all it takes is for someone um, to go to the bathroom and then not follow proper hand washing, and boom, they can transmit that microbe onto, you know, into water, into food, um, and then it gets, it's it spread. Okay, so fecal oral just, it sounds terrible, but it's not like you're eating a big piece of poop on your plate, okay? Remember, these are microorganisms. Okay, so when we talk about transmission of diseases, we have direct, okay? So direct is, yep, that microbe is, you know, traveling into you um, from someone or something directly, okay? Then when something in between is contaminated, that is what we call indirect transmission. So whether it's, you know, some type of food supply that's contaminated, water supply, um, biological products, so maybe something that someone would get through a transfusion. Um, I do want you to know the term 
fomites, okay? So a fomite is any inanimate object that can harbor microorganisms and then if a person touches it and then, you know, touches their face and they breathe it in, if it's a respiratory virus or a respiratory, you know, bacteria, um, you know, they can potentially get it um, simply by touching that object and then transmitting it into themselves, okay? So when we think of this, it's doorknobs, telephones, um, you know, patient bed rails, um, one of the, the things that's thought to be the most contaminated in a patient hospital room is actually the remote control because a lot of people touch it and it doesn't get disinfected um, that often. Often it's, you know, in a drawer or it's sitting on a counter. So um, that's what a fomite is. Okay, and then I had mentioned before, you know, the fecal oral route, which sounds terrible but it's simply someone didn't follow proper hand washing after they went to the bathroom um, and then they touched something and contaminated it and then it gets passed on to someone else. But it's indirect because it's getting deposited into something and then it makes it into the person. Okay, um, when we talk about droplet nuclei and aerosols, so things traveling through the air, so droplet nuclei is what we worry about with COVID-19. That is when someone is standing, you know, within six feet of you and they're talking or sneezing or coughing. So droplets do not travel great distances, okay? Typically, you know, six to 10 feet, that's droplet nuclei. Aerosols are, would be something like um, you know, coming from a crop dusting plane or something that's carried on the breeze um, or by wind, you know, upwind of where maybe you have um, a source of infection. So aerosols travel much further. Droplet nuclei is usually person to person and it's about six to 10 feet. So gross, okay? This is an uh, indication of a typical sneeze when someone is not, you know, sneezing or coughing into their elbow, that's what you're looking at. Gross. So we've mentioned nosocomial infections. Remember, nosocomial are infectious diseases that are acquired during a hospital stay. And, you know, I, it doesn't matter where you work, there are going to be nosocomial infections. And you guys are going to catch grief for it because patients are going to be really mad. They're going to be like, you know what, I came into the hospital with one thing and, you know, now I come out with another. What the heck? So, you know, you saw the, the Canadian woman who, you know, finally got really mad in the Superbugs video that was like, I, you know, I thought you go to the hospital to get better, not to get sicker. But where are all the sick immunocompromised people? Guess what? They're in the hospital, right? No healthy person checks into the hospital for a spa weekend. Everyone is sick, and so you're going to see these nosocomial infections. Um, so, yeah, you're going to take grief for it, but, the, you know, it just shows you the importance of following aseptic techniques. You're not going to be able to get rid of them completely, but, you know, they are manageable. So don't memorize these numbers. I just want to show you that the majority of nosocomial infections tend to be UTIs. Um, followed by surgical sites, okay? And, you know, thankfully, someone dying of sepsis or getting septic is still relatively low. You know, we hope it's gonna stay that way. Fingers crossed that it, it will. Okay, so I'm sure you've heard of these um, universal precautions. So this is just a series put out by the CDC where when you are treating a patient, you should assume that all patient specimens could harbor infectious agents. Um, so, I mean, you don't have to dress up like the Michelin Man, you know, and assume everyone has a prion disease, remember, because those are pretty rare. But yeah, you know, absolutely be careful. If you're dealing with a patient that has a respiratory infection, assume it's COVID-19 and act accordingly. Um, there's another technique called body uh, substance isolation. And this is where you know the person is infected, okay? So um, they've been diagnosed with a prion disease 
or you know it's a known patient that's tested positive for COVID-19. Um, it's basically the same techniques, it's just that the infection is known and already diagnosed as opposed to, you know, we don't know what this person has. But, um, you know, probably in your training, those of you who have taken uh, nursing classes, you know, I'm sure you've heard about this. Okay, so let's talk about Koch's postulates. Koch's postulates. So, first of all, Robert Koch was actually the guy way back in the day that thought to um, make, put bacteria on a slide and make a smear. So he, he invented the bacterial smear. So obviously, you know, a long, long time ago is when he uh, was doing his um, work. So Koch's postulates the, are the reason why I can give you that bacteria study guide. And, you know, I can say that this organism causes this disease. It's because of Robert Koch and Koch's postulates. So anytime an organism has been proven to cause a particular disease, it's because it has met Koch's postulates. So one other term that you're gonna hear is etiology, okay? And etiology is basically um, causing the disease. So when we say etiologic agent, it simply means whatever microbe is causing that particular disease. Okay, so let me go through Koch's postulates um, in word form, and then I'm gonna show you, um, you know, in a uh, graphic form. So here are the four things that have to happen for Koch's postulates to be true. First of all, you have, you know, let's say a population and they are all showing the same signs and symptoms, so you believe it is the same disease, and when you take a culture from them, you know, whether it's a blood culture, sputum, stool culture, you are finding evidence of the same microbe, okay? So maybe it's a gram-negative rod, let's say. So you're gonna take that sample, and you're gonna, in the lab, use your streak plate technique to isolate that microbe from infected subjects, let's say that they're people, and you're gonna get it growing in pure culture, okay? And this is where you do a gram stain or an acid fast stain, whatever you have to do to be able to, you know, find out its basic properties. Then you're gonna take the microbe from that pure culture and you are going to inoculate a healthy lab animal, because we can't do this to humans, it's not ethical, and that animal should develop the exact same disease as the original patients. Then when you take a culture from that now sick lab animal, you should be able to isolate the exact same, whether it's bacteria, fungi, you know, virus, whatever. If you do those four things, that meets Koch's postulates and that means that you've proven that that organism causes that particular disease. Okay, so here it is in graphic form. Okay, so let's say we have a guy, um, he's having some type of gastrointestinal infection, um, and he's one of many, okay, everyone's showing the same signs and symptoms. So let's take, let's say, a stool culture from him. We take it into the lab and we inoculate it on agar. Let's say it's a bacteria, so we can put it on agar. Um, use the streak plate technique to get a pure culture. And then, you know, we take a look at it under the microscope. Let's see what it is. Is it, you know, a, can it be gram stained, et cetera. Take that pure culture, and then we're going to inoculate it into a healthy lab animal. And then that lab animal should get the exact same disease. We're gonna take the same culture, and lo and behold, it's the same organism, okay? So that is what Koch's postulates are. So ending up this um, with, and let's see what you have to suffer through. Hey, we just have three more slides. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about epidemiology. So epidemiology is a really interesting field of study, okay? And obviously you're hearing a lot about public health nowadays. So it's not just using your medical background and your microbiology background. Um, hey, oh, for the love of God. You guys, please. 
please. Okay. So it's not only microbiology and medicine, but it's cultural things. It's psychology, statistics, ecology. It's a very complicated discipline, but basically it's studying. Hey, you guys, I'm sorry. Um, it's studying the frequency of disease and how diseases are passed and really how can we prevent these diseases from being passed forward. So um, the fact that you, you know, hear about social distancing guidelines, that is an element of epidemiology. Scientists are trying to understand how this virus is transmitted and then making decisions to keep it from spreading. Oh my God. Okay, so a couple of definitions here, all right? Reportable diseases are diseases that by law must be reported to local public health, okay? So measles, um, HIV infections, of course now COVID-19, those are examples of reportable diseases. Um, and all of that data from local public health gets fed. All right. All right, you guys, um, I'm gonna stop the video, put my dogs outside. I'll be back in the, to finish this up, okay? Thank you, I'm sorry.